This audiovisual shows our restoration efforts, including some amazing before and after views of some of the rail cars. Here is one example with more to be shown later in this presentation. The scale of restoration here is enormous for any museum, but particularly in the relatively small community of 20,000. A museum of this type of size would normally be located in a large city and operated by a senior level of government. It was this discovery of the in-lanes in the dining car Argyle that started the museum's unique collections policy of assembling complete specific train sets described as deluxe hotels on wheels. Along with other supporting cars, these tell a series of complimentary stories about travel aboard first-class transcontinental Canadian trains. Curatorial research and documentation is an important first step to establish authenticity that supports the expenditures of large sums of public money necessary for restoration to this level, but which are also designed to last in perpetuity. Once a car arrives, it is thoroughly checked to see what is needed to stabilize it as an artifact and prevent future deterioration inside and out. Roofs are always checked first, since water is extremely destructive on the laminated panels of the fine decorative wood veneers with delicate inlays that this museum has an abundance and must protect above all. Even with increased insulation and a reduction of winter temperatures in the cars to 5 degrees Celsius, there is still ice buildup on the roofs that continues their deterioration. Electrical service is essential to each car to operate the security systems, power tools, work lighting, and cleaning equipment. It also operates the heating and air conditioning systems needed for ongoing preservation of the fragile panels as well as display lighting and visitor comfort when the car is placed on tour. There is much more to restoration than stripping paint and re-varnishing. The restoration work itself needs to be sustained through security systems and environmental controls that regulate temperature and water vapor in the air. Otherwise, all of this work will continue to deteriorate. It is the heating and cooling systems that control temperature all year that add to the unique additional operating cost of museums. A custom design building was produced by consultants in 2012 to protect the cars, literally over hundreds of years, while dramatically lowering energy costs by using geothermal technology for heating and cooling. However, the large capital costs will require support from across the country, which can be expected due to the national importance of the collection. This is part of the 500-year museum plan that provides a guide for future decisions by all parties on museum development and operation. Security systems for intrusion and smoke detection must be installed and monitored 24-7. This tells staff and emergency response personnel exactly where a problem might be after hours and before anyone arrives at the museum to check. With hundreds of spaces to check quickly, this is important. HVAC units that operate continually all year are also required for temperature control to protect fragile, original, or restored panels. Further precautions such as mirrored outer window covers and shade cloth are also installed to reduce solar heat gain inside the cars and eliminate bleaching of the delicate wood panels. The process of restoring the exterior of a metal car is usually easier than the interior unless there are structural problems. This shows the transformation of Solarium Car River Rouge. If original window openings need to be restored, the process for a steel car is very expensive and great care needs to be exercised due to potential fire inside the car. These views show steel work on cars River Rouge and Rutherglen. Wooden car exteriors such as car 621 usually require more work and continual maintenance since wood deteriorates faster than steel. The shedding of wind-blown rain and snow is essential. It is the interiors of the cars with their wonderful inlaid exotic woods that are the most valuable and fragile assets at the museum and most acceptable to the natural process of decay. These photos show the basic process of removal and reinstallation of the paneling in River Rouge's observation parlor. Note the condition of the room before restoration when the car arrived from the railway work service. In a museum context, the urgency of preserving the restored interiors supersedes the need for maintaining exterior cosmetic appearance. When funding is an issue, exterior marketing aspects may have to take second place since paying the electrical cost to maintain temperature control inside the cars must take precedence for preservation. 
removing many layers of old paint, cleaning and repairing the original veneers, and adding many layers of new varnish is a long painstaking process. However, the result is a permanent, maintenance-free finish that is efficient to clean, but spectacular to look at by bringing out the beauty of the grains of exotic woods. The woods include black walnut, Circassian walnut, and Honduran mahogany, all with delicate inlays. This display panel of inlaid Honduran mahogany from a sleeping car upper berth is located to the left of this AV unit by the windows and shows the varnish restoration process. Most of this work was able to be done for many years using unemployed people on government job creation programs. Although much of the required labor was supplied, substantial supervision was necessary due to lack of skills to protect original but sometimes invisible clues inherent in the artifacts. This series of photos show extremely detailed restoration work on an inlaid berth division panel in the sleeper Ruther Glen. A small metal plate used to cover modern wiring for a new light location has been removed and replaced with a small piece of matching quarter sawn Honduran mahogany veneer. This new piece then needs to have its edges transitioned to the original wood and colored where needed before final varnishing can be done. In steel cars, wood panels are screwed to the steel frame of the car and covered by a strip of removable trim. Therefore, restoration is usually easier than in wooden cars where the panels are permanently fastened to the wood frame of the car making it difficult or impossible to remove them without destroying the interior panels and the originality of the cars as artifacts. Wooden cars in the original condition like these need a very different restoration approach and work must be done inside the car with the panels left intact. However, this work must also involve professional conservators and restoration consultants due to the complexity, age, and originality of the artifact. Surprisingly, no interior panel restoration has been done here since 1992 for several reasons. These include the expensive acquisition of the remaining cars to complete the collections policy, stabilizing the cars on arrival, major new site and landscaping, and the museum's huge relocation in 2002. Another reason is the very costly construction of the new building since 1999. As of 2012, about 60% of the new building interiors have been completed, so these costs will be ongoing for some time. As well, more than two-thirds of these cars still need restoration, conservation, and interpretation. These photos show the scale of temporary emergency procedures used to preserve the cars from weathering, usually due to budget limitations. The following series are before and after restoration photos of four cars from the Trans Canada Limited, done between 1977 and 1993. Each car costs about $200,000 to stabilize it and bring it to an acceptable and safe state for a public exhibition on tours. The first shows the process of restoration in dining car Argyle. All before and after photos for each car are taken from the same spot. This shows the restoration of the observation parlor looking towards the solarium in Car River Rouge. This is sleeping car Rutherglen looking along the aisle in the main room with its eight upper and lower sleeping sections. Although the car had arrived in good modernized condition, the restoration process was still very lengthy. The 1929 sleeper car Somerset had an unusual interpretation done with one side of the car restored to its original while the other deteriorated modernized side was also restored to its 1948 appearance. This group of photos shows the extraordinary transportation requirements of original wooden cars that were repatriated from the USA to Cranbrook with federal and provincial assistance. The Curzon and Omimi were internationally important cars that were also an integral part of Cranbrook's railway heritage. These show the effort and expense of transporting 65-ton artifacts that do not have wheels. It is first loaded by crane for the move by truck, then loaded onto a flat car for the long trip to Cranbrook, and finally by truck again to the museum site. The process of getting the Curzon and Omimi to Cranbrook from over 2,000 miles away cost a quarter million dollars each before any stabilization and restoration started. Security for these original artifacts was also a major factor en route. The last photo of the lifting of an even heavier 90-ton steel car shows the expense in getting artifacts of this size to Cranbrook as part of the collection's policy. 
Curzon and Omimi both had their wheels removed when they were converted to lakeside cottages near Fond du Lac and Wake Winnicani in Wisconsin. Therefore, stabilization work also required finding and installing original 12-ton wheel sets under the cars in Cranbrook. Massive exterior work was also required to rebuild and restore the exteriors of both the Curzon and Omimi to original appearance with their architecturally striking Edwardian-era design. The spectacular Art Nouveau interiors of these early 20th century first-class wooden cars still require a carefully planned mix of restoration-conservation rather than just restoration and will involve expensive professional expertise. Such work has been waiting since the Curzon arrived in 1992 and the Omimi in 1998. Sometimes original items must be stored in the cars to prevent loss or damage while awaiting funds to install such as these rare original furnishings found for the Omimi from a sister car. In addition to the extensive inlays that seem like vines on the paneling, there are two priceless stained glass half domes in this car, as well as these equally priceless stained glass transom windows in the Curzon Lounge. The more restrained Art Deco interiors of the 1920s steel cars also show high standards of surface decoration in first-class trains of this era, such as the 1929 Trans Canada Limited. This includes the subtle and expensive use of book matched walnut burls, almost impossible to obtain at this size today. The car Strathcona employs a unique layered parquet effect on its lounge walls instead of inlays. It is the only Canadian Pacific Railway car known to use this subtle effect. This presentation will now conclude by showing several other major restoration projects undertaken by the museum that do not involve the rail cars. The first project involved the restoration of the 1888 home of Colonel James Baker, the founder of Cranbrook. It was restored and rehabilitated by the Museum Foundation in 1982-83 as part of its community heritage mandate. It is one of the oldest buildings in this part of the province in its original location in Baker Park and is now privately owned with Protective Heritage Covenants. The sale proceeds were used to purchase the contents of the Royal Alexandra Hotel Cafe, now restored as the Royal Alexandra Hall at the museum. The CPR station from Elko at the western entrance to the Crow's Nest Pass, 43 miles from Cranbrook, was moved by truck to the former museum's site in 1987, where it became the museum's office, gift shop, and archives facility until the museum site relocated in 2002. Today, it is leased as part of the larger proposed development at the end of the Museum of Heritage Development Zone. This development, which is detailed in the 500-year museum plan, also recommends the restoration of the original 1898 Cranbrook Station as a business venture in partnership with the Community Preservation. The station is perhaps the most important symbol of Cranbrook's establishment as the major center in southeastern BC. The 65-foot-high railway water tower was moved about 1,000 feet from across the tracks to the former museum site in 1996. It was strategically placed in a newly landscaped area on the central axis of the main downtown street, Baker Street, and is also an iconic landmark seen along the highway to signify railway heritage. The large, 12,000-gallon wood tank is still inside the original insulated shell. These three photos show the evolution of this major community landmark between 1994 and 1999 after it was relocated and the former Unitel building was removed to expose the tower to Baker Street and the highway. The 1898 Railway Freight Shed, one of the earliest buildings in Cranbrook, was moved about 300 feet along the tracks in 1999 to make room for the new trains display tracks at the new museum site. It is now the northeast wing of the Mew Museum on two floors totaling 10,000 square feet. The Royal Alexandra Hall was the Community Millennium Project. It was originally the Grand Café of the Canadian Pacific Railway's Royal Alexandra Hotel in Winnipeg until its demolition in 1971. This original café was saved and stored in a semi-trailer for almost 25 years until the museum purchased the contents in 1999 from the sale of the Baker home. A new structural shell, shown here, was built to hold the hundreds of contents of this heritage room, recipient of Heritage Canada's Restoration Award in 2007. It is the museum's special events room capable of holding hundreds of people at a time 
and is also on tour due to its railway lineage. The Museum Railway Heritage Development Zone is about 1.4 kilometers long and was purchased by the city between 1987 and 1999. The museum has spent many years since on its development and landscaping. Major landscaping projects starting in 1989 involved several stages of planting large trees along several thousands of feet of the museum highway boulevards. Today these trees are maturing and form a softer setting for the museum rail cars and buildings behind them. The 1990 museum master plan has been followed for over 20 years in terms of site and facilities development, but in particular the relationship of the museum and the downtown area. The intersection of the two axes of these zones is the location of the water tower. This 1996 model of the museum development zone shows how several heritage structures were planned to be included. All of them are now in place with the only remaining question being the future of the original Cranbrook station. Parts of the community are working on projects in all three heritage areas, the railway, the downtown, and the Baker Hill Heritage Residential Area. The large heritage tour map in the Cranbrook History Gallery contains 96 historic listings and all of this material is on the museum web. In 2011, the Sunrise Rotary Club decided to cosmetically restore the exterior of the historic 1952 alcohol diesel locomotives that are on outdoor display at the former museum site. This project represents a beginning of partnerships with various sectors of the community that will be needed to move along many of the incomplete museum projects. This presentation may help you to understand the tremendous amount of work and expense required so far to provide visitors with a memorable tour, while also preserving original features and historic clues from these artifacts as a lasting legacy for future generations. There are many other historic displays in this restoration interpretive area, as well as in the museum entrance hall and in the Cranbrook History Gallery. Detailed information on the entire project is available on our large central website, trains